not be the same. Few people laughed. Few people cried. Most people were silent. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're looking at the crazy true life of J. Robert Oppenheimer, the father of the atomic bomb. Oppenheimer had been troubled all his life about who he was. For this video, we're doing a deep dive into the life of the American theoretical physicist, known for his role in the Manhattan Project during World War II. What fascinating facts about this historical figure stuck with you? Let us know in the comments. Sheltered upbringing. J. Robert Oppenheimer's father, Julius, immigrated to the United States from Germany as a teenager. He came with nothing, but in a rags-to-riches story, worked his way up to become a wealthy textile executive. Born in 1904, his son, J. Robert, whose first name was also Julius, grew up surrounded by luxury and art in their Manhattan apartment. The family had a collection of original paintings, including pieces by Picasso, Vuillard, and Van Gogh. The young boy led a sheltered, upper-class existence. His father's business success ensured that J. Robert and his brother Frank had the best education possible. He was sort of fully formed, and by the time he was three or four years old, they realized that he was something special. J. Robert made good use of his time in school, and even completed the third and fourth grade in one year. My childhood did not prepare me for the fact that the world is full of cruel and bitter things, Oppenheimer said. It gave me no normal, healthy way to be a bastard. Praise and ridicule. Oppenheimer showed his interest in science at a very young age. When he was just 12 years old, he exchanged letters with a local geologist about rock formations he'd noticed in Central Park. His correspondent nominated the young scientist to be a member of the New York Mineralogical Club and invited him to give a lecture. The club had a good laugh when a young boy appeared to speak instead of the adult they were expecting. They still let him give the lecture and gave him a solid round of applause at the end. Although the precocious youth got on well with adults, he struggled with his peers. His awkward manner made him an easy target as he moved into adolescence. He didn't grow up. He studied a great deal, which shielded him from the world. And the emotional side of him didn't catch up until much later. When he was 14, while at a summer camp, he was taunted by his fellow campers and locked naked in an ice house overnight. Incidents like this made it clear to Oppenheimer that his childhood had been a sheltered one, and that the world could be a cruel place. Seeking reassurance in his own intelligence, he became increasingly arrogant and aloof. College years. Oppenheimer was accepted into Harvard and graduated summa cum laude in just three years with a degree in chemistry. Now 21, he realized his true calling, physics. Then he moved on to Cambridge University, where he studied physics. A chain smoker who often forgot to eat, he was described by those who knew him as self-destructive and struggled with depression. Oppenheimer, like so many theoretical physicists, it turns out that if he walks through a lab, the instruments all break. And he's trying to do a rather delicate physical experiment, and he's not getting anywhere. On a trip to Paris, his friend, Francis Ferguson, tried to snap him out of his mood by sharing news that he was engaged. Oppenheimer jumped on Ferguson and tried to suffocate him. During those years, the young genius was almost expelled from Cambridge for trying to poison his physics tutor, Patrick Blackett. He was deeply unhappy at Cambridge. He'd covered an apple with chemicals and left it on Blackett's desk. Luckily, the apple wasn't eaten. Oppenheimer's influential father kept the school from pressing criminal charges. Almost overwhelmed with his recurrent depression, he was, he later said, at the point of bumping myself off. Academia and relationships. After Cambridge, Oppenheimer studied under renowned physicist and mathematician Max Born at the University of Göttingen in Germany. There, he rubbed elbows with the great scientific minds of his age, including Wolfgang Pauli, Werner Heisenberg, Enrico Fermi, Paul Dirac, and Edward Teller. I had very great misgivings about myself on all fronts, he said. I hadn't been good. I hadn't done anybody any good. And here was something I felt just driven to try. At 23, he obtained his Doctor of Philosophy degree and returned to the United States, where he was given fellowships at both Harvard and Caltech. By the time he was ready to return to America, he was focused and confident, an ambitious young man with an international reputation. However, his personal relationships continued to involve drama and scandal. His friend and colleague Linus Pauling cut ties after Oppenheimer invited his wife for a tryst in Mexico. 
Oppenheimer became a professor at Berkeley, where he published papers on a range of topics, from theoretical astronomy to nuclear physics and quantum field theory. For three years, he dated Gene Tatlock, a member of the American Communist Party who introduced him to left-wing causes. But the relationship was problematic. She was volatile and moody. After three years, she left him. After that relationship ended, Oppenheimer courted German-American Catherine Kitty Harrison. However, Kitty was already married. When she became pregnant, she divorced her husband and married Oppenheimer. But that didn't stop her from going after the well-known scientist. When she saw Oppenheimer, she grabbed him. They were together, of course, for the rest of their lives. But it was, God knows, a tumultuous relationship. Oppenheimer may have continued to see Tatlock and later had an affair with his friend's wife, Ruth Tolman. The Manhattan Project. During World War II, U.S. President Roosevelt urgently called for the development of the atomic bomb. So the American scientists were struggling to get the government to recognize that it was important. They had a lot of meetings. They needed scientists to come in and help them work out the numbers. In 1942, this led to the Manhattan Project and the creation of the Los Alamos Laboratory in New Mexico. Oppenheimer was put in charge of scientists whose mission was to create nuclear weapons. Los Alamos had to be shrouded in complete secrecy. Army intelligence officers watched everything and everybody, especially those with questionable pasts. Many people thought he wasn't the right fit to lead such a large project. However, Director Major General Leslie Groves saw in Oppenheimer a pragmatic intelligence and, quote, overweening ambition. Oppenheimer's wide-ranging talents and leadership skills proved crucial to the project's success. Dr. Oppenheimer probably carries more nuclear secrets in his head than any other person. On July 16, 1945, the first test of an atomic bomb took place in the desert 210 miles from Los Alamos. Although the observers were stationed 20 miles away, there was no missing the shockwave and massive fireball, and desert sand turned to glass. In the dead silence of the morning, at 5.29.45 Mountain War Time, the Jornada del Muerto was bathed in an intense flash of a light that man had only seen from the stars. When describing the experience, Oppenheimer said that he recalled a line from the Bhagavad Gita. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. Blood on his hands. On August 6th and 9th, 1945, the United States dropped atomic bombs on the Japanese cities Hiroshima and Nagasaki, killing between 129,000 and 226,000 people, most of them civilians. We have used it in order to shorten the agony of war, in order to save the lives of thousands and thousands of young Americans. Oppenheimer was dismayed at the bombing of Nagasaki, which he felt had been unnecessary. Just over a week later, he visited President Truman to express his concerns, admitting that he felt he had blood on his hands for his role in designing the bombs. Infuriated at the show of remorse, Truman threw him out. It's not surprising Truman just about threw him out of his office. It was the president's decision. It wasn't Oppenheimer's decision. Moving forward, the man dubbed the father of the atomic bomb worked with the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission to control the use and proliferation of nuclear weapons. If there is another world war, this civilization may go under. We need to ask ourselves whether we're doing all we can. When Truman approached the commission about creating a hydrogen bomb, Oppenheimer opposed it. This opposition to increasing the country's weapons of mass destruction led to suspicion of his loyalties. To this day, Oppenheimer's reputation is haunted by the unproven charge that he was a Russian spy. Accusations of disloyalty. Since 1941, Oppenheimer had been under FBI surveillance. He was associated with various progressive causes and organizations, including the American Civil Liberties Union and anti-fascism in Spain. He also had close ties to the Communist Party through members such as Gene Tatlock, his wife Kitty, and his brother Frank. In 1943, his friend Hakan Chevalier, a professor of French literature, suggested passing information to the Soviet Union. Oppenheimer rejected the idea, but delayed reporting it, and provided inconsistent accounts to protect his friend. At first, Oppenheimer did not report the Chevalier incident to anyone, but his recent radical past haunted him at Los Alamos. In the post-war years, McCarthyism swept through the United States, leading to political repression and the persecution of left-wing individuals. For over a decade, American political leaders 
trampled democratic freedoms in the name of protecting them. Oppenheimer had made various enemies, such as AEC Commissioner Louis Strauss, who disliked Oppenheimer on personal grounds and for his opposition to the hydrogen bomb. In 1949, Oppenheimer was brought to testify in front of the House Un-American Activities Committee, during which the Chevalier incident came back to haunt him. Later, he said that his nerve just gave way. Ultimately, his government security clearance was revoked. He was no longer able to work in government or policy. Oppenheimer, who had been totally unaware of the scale of the campaign against him, was stunned. Post-war years. Oppenheimer spent his remaining years continuing to write, teach, and lecture on physics and the role of science in society. But his heart wasn't in it. In 1965, he was diagnosed with throat cancer. This was a result of a lifetime of cigarette smoking and not his exposure to radioactive materials. Despite treatment, he died in 1967 at the age of 62. His funeral services were attended by a crowd of more than 600 former associates from the scientific, political, and military communities. I can't recall ever seeing him happy, you know, just relaxed and having fun. I don't have the feeling that he ever felt good about himself. But if he was ever, in any sense, at peace with himself. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. In popular culture, the Manhattan Project remains a source of fascination in popular culture. Oppenheimer was played by Sam Waterston in the 1980 BBC TV series Oppenheimer. We do not operate well when the important facts, the essential conditions which limit and determine our choices are unknown. Dwight Schultz took on the role of the father of the atomic bomb in 1989's Fat Man and Little Boy. There's a lot of buzz around the Christopher Nolan film Oppenheimer, which will be released in 2023. And they won't understand it. until they've used it. It has a star-studded cast that includes Killian Murphy as Oppenheimer, Emily Blunt as his wife Kitty, and Florence Pugh as Jean Tatlock. Clearly, audiences continue to be fascinated by these historic events and the man who led the way. Did you enjoy this video? Check out these other clips from WatchMojo, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.